The scripture is on the uh, edge of your outline. Let's read the scripture story together, and then we'll uh, look at it. As we look at this scripture story, um, and just praying about it today, trying to figure out what the Lord would have us to do tonight, I may preach a little bit, and then we pray a little bit, and then I'll preach a little bit, and we'll pray a little bit. I'm not sure how that's going to go. So is everybody ready to just do whatever? Okay, so we might go a little out of order, but we're going to make sure that we spend some uh, considerable, wonderful time in prayer tonight. Acts chapter 3. On one day, which day was it? We don't even know. It's just one day. Isn't that great? I mean, I just love it that some of the stories in the Bible are just like one day. <laughs> it's so, I think it's so cool that God can do something on any one day. I mean, God can just move. And uh, I think back to times, um, like for instance, when I was in Bible college, and um, we'd start chapel at um, 9.30 in the morning. We had a 7.30 class, we had an 8.30 class, and at 9.30 we had chapel every day. And we'd start chapel at 9.30 in the morning, and sometimes just God would move. <laughs> and uh, what day was it? It was just one day. <laughs> and there were times where chapel started at 9.30 in the morning, and it didn't end till 9.30 at night and you just go, and the whole day just got canceled. And what was interesting is when that would happen, teachers who weren't going to go to chapel because they needed some more prep time for their 10.30 or 11.30 class, those teachers would, they would leave their classroom that had no students in it and come to chapel because they wanted God, Amen. right? And then people that worked in the cafeteria realized no one is coming to lunch, and the cafeteria workers would come to chapel because they were hungry for God too. I mean, those, those were good days when God did that. And you know, when, when, when does God do things? In his own timing, when he wants, and it's just one day. One day this happened. Um, one day God healed you. One day God saved you. Isn't that the truth? So anyway, Acts chapter three starts out with this really beautiful day, one day. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. So. There was kind of a culture, a tradition of praying at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate, the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. Speaking about Barabbas there. Verse 15, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Messiah would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. Don't you love that translation? Wiped out. How many of you are glad that sins can be wiped out? Not just covered, not just forgotten about for a while, not swept under the rug. I mean... Through Jesus, sins are wiped out. Isn't that good? 
wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. How many of you know when sins are wiped out, there's the refreshing that comes? And that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. That means Jesus is coming again. Verse 21, heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So the Acts of the Apostles is a short little book. It's written by Luke, and it contains the history of all that Jesus began to do and teach, but then began to work through the apostles and through the church. And so last week, we've, we've looked at Acts chapter 1. We looked at um, his promise that we'd receive power. We looked at Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And today, we're just looking at one day where God did a miracle and after doing that miracle, thousands of people chose Jesus as their Lord and Savior because of what they saw happen in the temple that day. There was a miracle, and then Peter preached the gospel to them. See how he preached kind of a sermon after the miracle? And that sermon explained to them how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies of the Old Testament, how Jesus died on the cross for their sins to be forgiven, and how faith in Jesus wipes away sin causes times of refreshing to come and for us to receive all the good things that God has for us in this New Testament era. He filled a lot of information in that sermon, didn't he? It's a pretty simple sermon, but it's packed, packed, packed with New Testament church theology. What I want to do tonight is look specifically at the miracle of the, of the healing of this lame man at the gate beautiful. So it, that's just the name they gave for that particular gate. There were uh, gates on each of the sides of the temple complex in the first century. And uh, if you'd like to know more about that, I mean, I would just encourage you. It's kind of interesting and enjoyable. On YouTube, there are all kinds of really interesting videos that can give you like a flyover view of the uh, temple complex as it would have been situated in the days of Jesus. And uh, in some of those computer-generated flyover views of what the temple complex would have looked like, it would describe to you where the gate beautiful is. Uh, it would describe to you where Solomon's colonnade is, which is mentioned here. It's a portion of the, of the temple complex where people met. And um, so you can check that out. It's kind of interesting to do that. And it might give you, if you'll do that for fun tonight, so remember last week we kind of made fun of watching Netflix when you go home? So tonight you can go home and you can watch YouTube videos about the first century temple complex. Does that sound good? All right, there you go. And uh, it'll give you a little bit of context to kind of see where that gate was, where it was situated, and where was Solomon's colonnade, where some of this took place. So let's look specifically at this miracle. First we see that there's a lame man, there's a lame man that is set at this gate each day to beg. Uh, the Bible tells us that he is lame from birth. So being lame from birth, whatever his condition was, the Bible doesn't describe it all to us medically, but whatever his condition was, this guy had never walked. So it's not like he used to walk and he needed heal healing to walk again. Imagine, imagine being lame from birth and never even having the opportunity to learn to walk. Hear what I'm saying? That's a big difference, isn't it? And I think one of the most interesting things about this miracle is not only that the Bible says that his feet and ankles were strengthened, but that he immediately, after being helped up, he began to walk and then run and then leap, and he'd never taken a step. I mean, that's what the Bible's telling us. Part of the miracle is not just that his, his feet and ankles were strengthened. Part of the miracle is that like, this guy learned to walk like that. I can't even comprehend uh, how God worked that out, but he did. So this man has been lame from birth. He's carried to the, the temple gate that they refer to as the beautiful gate. And it's amazing how God does several miracles at one time, strengthening his feet and ankles and helping him to walk. Can I tell you something? All of us have some infirmity from a very early age from when we were born. Listen to, what, listen to what Psalm 51 verse 5 says. When David was, was pleading with God for forgiveness, he said, surely 
I have been a sinner from birth. Surely I've been a sinner from birth. Now listen, we don't believe in original sin. Original sin is a doctrine that says when a baby comes to life, the, the second a baby is born, it's headed straight to hell because of original sin. We don't believe that. I believe that God is merciful to babies and small children who have not even come to a place where they can tell their right hand from their left, which is the same compassion that God said he would have on people in Nineveh in the book of Jonah. There are 200,000 people in this city who cannot tell their right hand from their left. These are people that have not reached an age of, of mental, emotional uh, thinking accountability, spiritual accountability with God. And so we don't believe in original sin. We don't believe that your baby's um, on its way to hell the, the, the first moment that it's conceived. Amen? Amen? And so I'm thankful for that. Um, but here's, here's what I do believe. I do believe that a pretty, at a pretty early age, I start misbehaving before God. At a pretty early age, sometimes even before I understand what I'm doing, I start doing some things that are disobedient to God. Can I just tell you? Now... I love my kids, and they're going to hate me that this is going to be online, but I'm going to say it. I love my kids, but my kids started disobeying me before they could say the word no. How many of you know that? Like, your kids, your kids started to dishonor their father and their mother before they could talk about it. Am I right? And there's, there's a propensity in us to error there's a propensity in us to error. It's the flesh and it's the sinful nature. Is everybody with me today? And so we all have a condition that we're born with that needs Jesus. Amen. Every one of us needs a Savior. The nicest, most pleasant, most wonderful person you know needs a Savior. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And how many of you are glad that though we've all sinned, there's a gift from God, which is salvation through Christ Jesus. Amen? The other thing that I love about this story is that the lame man is healed. Isn't that beautiful? It's a beautiful miracle of healing where God transforms a situation that has been present since birth. We can't even, I don't even know what the situation was, but he needed that transformation. So the guy was lame. Here's the next thing I want you to notice there was this process of looking that takes place in the story. So the Bible says that as Peter and John walked up to the gate beautiful, they, they approached this guy that everybody walks past pretty much every day. So the Bible says that the people took him there every day. It's kind of a common thing. And he begged pretty much every day. They kind of had a standard spot. Hey, this is my, this is my place. This is where I, this is where I beg. Um, all the people, after they saw him, the Acts told us in the story that we read, that after they saw him jumping and leaping and praising God, walking in the temple courts, they all recognized him as the man who used to sit begging, right? So he's been there a lot of times, right? How many times did Peter and John pass him by and not really look at him? Probably a lot of times. Because Peter and John were going to pray at the typical normal time that people would go to pray at 3 o'clock. So how many people walked past him and didn't pay attention? How many people walked past him, gave him a little bit of money and didn't pay attention to him other than just pacifying their own conscience, give him some money and walk on? Most of the time, no one paid him much attention. So I want you to see the first thing that happens here is that two believers looked at the lame man. Two believers, Peter and John, two people just like you and just like me. And here's my challenge for you tonight. Who are you looking at and how are you looking at them? Who are you looking at and how are you looking at them? Who are you passing by every day and not realizing that God's trying to bring them to your attention? That's right. Amen. There's probably a lot of people that I pass by each day, and God's trying to bring them to my attention in some way. I just want to challenge you to become like Peter and John, who would take the time to look at somebody that you're not required to look at. Look at somebody that doesn't owe you anything. Look at somebody that nobody else looks at. Look at somebody 
that nobody else wants to look at. Look at somebody that most people are probably saying, I wish he wasn't here. Let's look at him. Let's let God bring them to our attention. Hear what I'm saying? As I say that, you can probably think of some people like that. You know, um, we all have questions about, you know, people that we see. And sometimes we wonder, what's going on in their life? What are they thinking? We drove past a, a homeless person recently, and my wife looked, at, and this guy was dressed super weird. And my wife looked at me, and she said, do you, think, do, you, do you think homeless people think, let's wear weirder clothes so that we get more money? I was like, well, I don't know. That's a really good idea. I said, I think I'm going to get like a really nice suit and a power tie and just hold up a sign that says, I have bad luck, give me money. And see how I do just like on a Saturday. <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting to find out? Like, that would be a really strange way to dress and then just beg for money. Yeah, how much money do you think I get? She, Nancy says none. How many of you dare, like, dare me to do it right now? You're like, come on, <laughs> now I'm in trouble. My wife's like, you dummy, why did you say that? <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting to find out, though? Um, or what if, what, if, what if you got, like, a stormtrooper costume from Star Wars and you're just like, you know, all I have left in life is my stormtrooper co costume. Please give me money. I mean, how do you think you'd do as a beggar, you know? I, there are things that people might do to cause people to look at them, right, in that kind of situation. This guy, he probably didn't do anything to cause them to look at him. Notice that, that Peter and John looked at him, and then look what happens next. Peter and John looked at him when they didn't have to, when there was nothing that really drew their attention to him. And then they said to him, look at us. So what does that mean? That means he was begging, but he would not look at them. Do you see what I'm saying? Amen. He was begging, but he would not look at them. So the first challenge for us is, will we look at others as God brings them to our attention Will we look at others with even our own self-discipline to look at others? Will we look at others, and then will we ask them to look at us? Most of us don't want to say to someone, look at me. Most of us don't want to say that, do we? Because number one, we might not like the attention, but number two, we don't like the responsibility. That's the problem. Yeah. Am I right? right? Peter and John, when they, when, they, when they looked at that man, they looked with the eyes of the Lord, and then they took responsibility, and they said, look at us. Let me tell you something. Jesus needs, Jesus needs the church, that's us, all of us, not just pastors, not just an organization, Jesus needs you and I, the people of God, to take on the responsibility to say to our world, look at me, I'm following Jesus. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? Look at me, I'm following Jesus. And when we do that, we take on a responsibility, don't we? But most of the time, many times, we really don't want to take on that responsibility because we'd rather do other things. How many of you have been there? Some of us say that all the time, but some of us say that just some of the time, right? In occasional circumstances. And we're kind of pushed down the directing of the Holy Spirit who's asking us to step up and stand out for Jesus in a, in a certain circumstance. There are moments where I think the Holy Spirit just specifically urges us to, to ask the, the world to look at us, and we might say what Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Everybody hear what I'm saying? I think it's really neat that, that there's this amazing looking that takes place here. Lord, help me look redemptively at my world. Lord, help me, help me see people who need you and care about it. And then, Lord, help me take on the responsibility of, of being the one that can say, look at me as I tell you about Christ. And that look begins a relationship between you and a person where Jesus can be shared, where compassion can be given and received, where kindness can be displayed. But 
You're not going to have kindness and compassion and care and the opportunity to share Jesus with others if we're not willing to take on the responsibility and say, look at us. Boy, that's heavy, isn't it? It sounds pretty simple in the story, but man, when you think about it, Peter, Peter like stepped out when he said, look at us. He stepped out in that moment, didn't he? And he took the responsibility for the situation. So here's this lame man, and Peter says, look at us. I challenge you to, to, to let your life be one that can be looked at. Can we do that? I'm going to ask the musicians to come forward, and so we're going to pray just a little bit, and then I'm going to preach some more. And so we're going to kind of sprinkle uh, prayer with um, preaching tonight. And um, I don't know how this is going to work, but we're going to find out in a second. Maggie's going to start this song. These are both in G, right? Okay, making sure I'm still in the right key. And uh, here's what I'd like us to do right now. Um, everybody, just take a second and, and just think about, think about people that you pass by. Um, if you've been at Livestream Church for a while, we challenge every person at Livestream Church to consider, um, turn the piano down just a little bit in the room. Uh, we challenge every person at Livestream Church to consider who, who is in the theater of your life and has a front row seat to look at you. Those people are in, those are the people in your household, your oikos. Those are the people in your relational world that, that you can share Jesus with because they can see Jesus in you. How simple is that? I mean, the people in my, the people in my oikos list, they're just, they're people from around Washington. They're people from around town. Some of you have neighbors on your oikos list. There's a man in our church, he has a first cousin on his oikos list, and, and she said last week, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Um, there, there are people in this room right now who put someone on their oikos list last year, and that person got saved last year. That's good news, isn't it? I think it's amazing. And so I want you to just take a minute, and uh, I just want you to pray about who, who is around you in your life, at your work, in your neighborhood, in your family, um, in, the, in the routine of your day, the people that you have started to build some degree of friendship or relationship with uh, at the convenience store. You see them routinely over and over again. You've learned each other's names. Uh, maybe those people are the ones in your relational world that Lord, the Lord really wants you to look at, to look at differently, and then to take on the responsibility to maybe say, look at me. I'm a believer, and I can tell you about Jesus. Can we pray about that right now? Can you just look at me?